All right. <clears throat> it looks like it's 2 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Camille Jackson Singleton. I am the Strategic Cyber Threat Lead for IBM Security X-Force's Threat Intelligence Team. And I'm very excited to be here today um, to speak with you. And I, I live right here in Utah in North Salt Lake. So especially excited to rub shoulders with others in Utah and hear about the security issues you are grappling with and how you are addressing them. And even more to do this in real life, right? Face to face, which is such a treat, especially after the pandemic that we've all been enduring for so long. So um, to be at a conference and actually see people face to face um, is so rare and it's very delightful. Um, and some of my colleagues also from IBM Security X-Force are at this conference. We listened to them earlier today. Snow and Grifter um, are on the penetration testing and incident response side of the house. Um, and I'm on the threat intel side of the house for IBM Security X-Force. As force. So I'm looking specifically at threat actors, their tactics, techniques, and procedures, how these TTPs are evolving over time, and what we can do as organizations to better defend against them and against these TTPs. And one thing that has definitely been at the top of our list the past couple of years, probably for all threat intel teams, is ransomware. We see tons and tons of ransomware every year. Um, this year is no different. Even as uh, ransomware groups are coming and going and shutting down and their arrests, um, their activity and tempo is still very high and the profits they make are very high as well, which, uh, which makes it very attractive for cyber criminals. So one ransomware group I've been looking at in particular is called Ryuk. And one reason this group is so interesting to me um, is because Ryuk is the group that X-Force has seen most commonly get on industrial control system networks. And ICS networks are, of course, um, networks, software and hardware that control industrial processes. So this is like huge manufacturing, machinery, and energy generation plants. And so when this equipment is affected, the effects can be really significant. Um, potentially things explode, um, there could potentially be loss of life, or at least uh, operations go down, and those critical processes can't function for a little bit of time. So that's why we care so much about this. So, um, so I wanted to look a little about how Ryuk has gotten onto ICS networks, and, um, and how that has happened and what the implications might be. So I wanted to start off by first discussing the ransomware landscape for industrial control system networks overall. And X-Force data shows that so far this year, in 2021, 32% of all attacks we have seen on industrial control systems have been from ransomware. This is a greater percentage than any other attack type. It's almost one third of all of the incidents we remediate. So it's pretty significant. And admittedly, even when you look at non-ICS organizations, ransomware does, again, emerge as the top attack type. So this isn't necessarily unique to uh, industrial control systems, but arguably the effect of ransomware on organizations with industrial control systems does have a unique effect. And to get into that a little more, um, I feel like, you know, fairly commonly, I will hear the argument that, yeah, well, we're seeing a lot of ransomware attacks, and yeah, a lot of these ransomware attacks affect organizations that have ICS networks, but often the ransomware doesn't actually get onto the ICS portion of the network. There's the IT network that has email and, you know, all the other uh, enterprise functions that a normal organization will have, and then you want to have segmentation, and then there's the OT network, right? So, so it is true that um, more often than not, ransomware doesn't get on the ICS or operational technology portion of the network. But the assumption that there are no operational effects, um, I would definitely counter that. 
Um, so our, re our research has shown that in cases where there's a ransomware attack against an organization with ICS networks, 56% of the time, the attack does affect operations. And admittedly, often these effects um, happen colonial pipeline style. So perhaps the ransomware doesn't actually get onto operational portions of the network, but those operational portions are still shut down as a precaution to ensure that the ransomware doesn't migrate over there, um, that the ransomware doesn't uh, have the potential to get into those most sensitive, most critical portions of the network. But even with Colonial Pipeline, it was clear, you know, the attack caused the company to shut down uh, delivery of critical gasoline supplies for days, and um, it caused fluctuations in the gasoline market. I was actually in Florida on vacation when this attack hit, and we had to go to three different gas stations before we could actually find gas, we, and after that we had to wait in line for about 25 minutes. So for the normal average person, this attack definitely had real world physical effects. Um, so, so that's something to keep in mind. And, um, and some of you might be thinking, well, I thought this talk was going to talk about when ransomware does actually get onto ICS networks, and, and yes, it does. But this point about ransomware attacks that don't get on ICS portions of the network still having operational impact is important and one I wanted to be sure to make. So looking at the ransomware attack landscape overall for a minute, this graph shows um, most of the ransomware types the X-Force incident response team has remediated since 2018. And admittedly, this includes both ICS and non-ICS um, companies, but I wanted to show this full picture just because there are some interesting trends I wanted to pull out. One thing you'll notice is that Ryuk ransomware is the highest percentage, um, holds the highest percentage of attacks we've seen at 18% of all the ransomware attacks we've seen since 2018, so more than any other. So to know Kibi or Revil ransomware comes in at a close second at 15% of attacks. And it's worth noting that this year, in 2021, that percentage is actually much higher. It's, uh, it was close to 40. We'll see if it goes down closer to the end of the year because um, they have gone out of business, hopefully for good. Um, but they are second, and then WannaCry is 13%. And we have seen quite a bit of WannaCry ransomware affect ICS portions, actually get onto ICS portions of the network. And this is in part because it's inherently difficult to patch ICS networks, and so it's hard to avoid that eternal blue exploit. So whereas the rest of the world has kind of moved on from WannaCry, it's kind of a non-issue, everyone has patched against it. Um, that's not true for all ICS environments. Um, so I wanted to point that out. And then um, diving a little more into Ryuk specifically. So the Ryuk ransomware group first appeared in August 2018. And assuming they have not shut down, we don't have clear indication of that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they haven't. Um, this makes them the longest, one of the longest running ransomware groups. Um, most ransomware groups survive about 18 months before uh, they fear law enforcement activity and will shut down. So they've been around for a long time. And they also operate under a ransomware as a service model where central contractors or uh, central administrators contract out to affiliates the task of gaining initial access to victims of interest and actually deploying the ransomware. And those central administrators are often the ones who actually develop the ransomware code as well. They take a portion of the proceeds. Um, so this is how their business operates. And even the affiliates themselves will sometimes contract out um, gaining initial access. So it's a huge business model, uh, lots of cyber criminals working together, huge networks of activity. Um, and we're seeing this become fairly sophisticated. And at least one of the groups, X-Force assesses, assesses that at least one of the groups that 
has affiliated with Ryuk is a group we track as ITG08, also known as FIN6, um, one of those cyber criminal groups. Early campaigns for Ryuk um, focus very heavily on using phishing emails, deploying TrickBot, and sometimes times Emotet malware to gain initial access to targets of interest. And more recently, uh, Ryuk actors have used, uh, again, phishing emails, but things such as the Booer Loader, Bazaar Loader, so they've kind of moved away from uh, using TrickBot access. Um, there was a lull in Ryuk activity from spring to fall 2020, and admittedly, we are in another lull right now, but it's, it's possible that lull will end. Um, but uh, once they started up again in fall 2020, their campaigns um, shifted to Cobalt Strike, Bazaar Loader, Boer Loader, um, and also post-2020, they are known to act very swiftly and deploy ransomware sometimes within hours of gaining initial access to an environment. So that's extremely fast, faster than most of their ransomware groups were aware of. And then also, um, earlier this year, the French government um, released um, some analysis indicating that newer Ryuk variants have worm-like capabilities. And we're going to get into that a little more in the next few slides and talk about um, those implications. In terms of industries, Ryuk prefers to go after. This group loves hospitals. And whereas some ransomware groups, especially during the pandemic, have kind of stood down on attacking hospitals and medical facilities, this is definitely not the case for Ryuk. And if anything, they seem to prefer this as a target. And in October 2020, it attacked a US hospital chain um, with more, more than 250 facilities um, and uh, crippling all of these facilities and leading to some chaos impeding some care for patients. Um, so, so that's something to keep in mind. This group doesn't uh, seem to hold back in this regard. And in addition, Ryuk ransomware attackers have demonstrated a particular affinity for attacking organiz large organizations that rely heavily on ICS networks. And within X-Force, we've seen them especially go after manufacturing and transportation both of which rely on uh, ICS networks, and we know they also affect industrial distribution, oil and gas companies, we'll talk about some uh, examples there, and energy and utilities as well. But most importantly about Ryuk, as I stated at the beginning, this is the ransomware strain that X-Force has most commonly seen get onto ICS networks. And of course, not just on organizations that have ICS networks, but actually on the ICS networks themselves. And so, um, so that's definitely concerning. And it's not clear whether Ryuk actors are doing this intentionally or whether it has just happened by happenstance, uh, if they just got lucky on multiple occasions. But what we can say for sure is that it has happened. And the fact that Ryuk tends to target organizations with ICS networks so heavily might automatically increase their chances for migrating into those more sensitive environments every now and then. So in one major example of Ryuk on ICS networks, in early 2020, it became public that Ryuk ransomware attackers had targeted at least five oil and gas organizations and potentially more than this. And these flurries of Ryuk attacks on similar organizations um, is fairly common. We've seen them do this against hospitals as well, and it's possible that we'll see a flurry of Ryuk attacks against a cluster of similar ICS organizations at some point again in the future as well. Comments by some observers close to these victims, these oil and gas victims, suggest that Ryuk ransomware actually got on to ICS portions of the network in multiple of these incidents. So at least two, 
maybe all five, uh, the Ryuk ransomware uh, did migrate over into the uh, ICS portion. And one of these incidents was explained in greater detail in a bulletin put out by the U.S. Coast Guard. The U.S. Coast Guard bulletin detailed that the threat actors first gained initial access to the environment through a phishing email, and this makes a lot of sense since we know Ryuk actors, especially in 2019 and 2020, early 2020, were relying heavily on trick bot phishing emails to gain initial access. And from here, based on what X-Force has seen in other incidents, extrapolating from what we've seen, it's possible that the Ryuk actors deployed a PowerShell loader and then a Cobalt Strike beacon, or potentially the Empire Post Exploitation Framework, to gain an initial foothold in the environment. And then um, the actors probably used SMB or WMIM exec as well as credential harvesting techniques to move laterally throughout the network and eventually gain access to domain controllers. And this point is really important because from what X-Force has seen, this domain controller access is in some cases, what has allowed Ryuk to gain access into ICS portions of the network? The Coast Guard Bulletin didn't make clear exactly what they saw in, in the case they examined, but it's possible that domain controllers were also the crossover point um, in, in that particular case. But the Coast Guard did indicate that poor segmentation played a role in the attack and X-Force has seen the same, that poor segmentation tends to play a role in Ryuk actors getting access to ICS networks. In the vast majority of ransomware attacks today, attackers are looking to gain access to domain controllers and from here deploy the ransomware. And in some cases, it appears they can use domain administrator accounts when used with nat flat network designs to also move into ICS portions of a network. In the case of the attack on the natural gas compression facility that the U.S. Coast Guard Bulletin talked about, access to domain administrator, um, well, the attack created a disruption to the entire IT or enterprise portion of the network. And I assume this to mean the attackers gained sufficient access to a domain administrator accounts to, de to deploy ransomware on nearly every device on the IT network. In addition, because the actors did gain access to, uh, to ICS portions of the network, they were able to affect, um, they were able to disrupt physical access and security cameras they were also able to uh, encrypt files that were critical to cargo proce transfer process control. So for this facility, that was really, really critical. And a report from CISA further indicated that the natural gas compression facility suffered loss of availability to human machine interfaces or HMIs, as well as data historians and polling servers and loss of view because um, impacted assets could not receive or aggregate data from some of those lower level operational technology devices. The attack did not affect programmable logic controllers or PLCs, so the facility didn't actually lose control of operations, but they still decided to shut down, uh, conduct a controlled shutdown of operations. And as I said before, this is relatively common, you know, whether ransomware gets on the ICS network or not. We often see this, uh, this avenue uh, chosen and simply is a precaution. Um, although in this case, it was, it was more than just a precaution. So primary facility operations were down for over 30 hours while the attack was investigated and remediated. And um, full remediation, especially of the IT network, I'm sure took even longer. So obviously this attack led to some pretty significant physical real world effects for this particular organization. 
So I mentioned previously that new versions of Ryuk ransomware now have worm-like capabilities. And I would like to return to that idea um, because it's possible that this could have implications for organizations with ICS networks. The French government, and specifically the agency ANSI, first originally made this discovery of Ryuk's worm-like capabilities. So it's really to them uh, to which this credit for this discovery is due. But X-Force malware reverse engineers have also taken a look at recent Ryuk samples. And our analysis has shown that Ryuk strains tend to use the address resolution protocol, or ARP cache, and internet control message protocol, or ICMP, to enumerate network shares, and then copy itself to accessible shares using RPC, or remote procedure call and executes remotely using scheduled tasks. So that's the mechanism by which this worm happens. But even beyond that, the fact that Ryuk might have worm-like capabilities uh, is concerning because of the precedent we have for other worms that have gotten onto ICS networks. So X-Force analysis, um, of Ryuk malware showed that discovered samples were packed in loaders that were similar to those used in Emotet and TrickBot campaigns. And Emotet has been known to worm into ICS networks in the past. In some cases, forcing manufacturers to reduce operations for weeks and therefore decreasing their revenue and really causing quite a bit of uh, damage and concern for those environments. Another worm that has made its way onto ICS networks is Configure. This is an old worm. It was first discovered in 2008, but it is still around. And X-Force just recently has found this worm on ICS networks as well. And so, so that's a worm that's also concerning. And then the WannaCry ransomware worm has also wrecked havoc in ICS environments, in some cases costing corporations more than $170 million in damages and uh, requiring quite a bit of cleanup and remediation. So worms have been bad news for ICS environments in the past. And this new development of Ryuk ransomware having worm-like capabilities could potentially give Ryuk a higher likelihood of worming into ICS environments in the future, especially if that is a goal that the ransomware group members happen to have or something they're aiming to do. So these developments are a little concerning. Ryuk getting onto ICS networks, Ryuk ransomware adopting worm-like capabilities, but delving into these instances and looking at specific case studies can be powerful because it can provide insight on what organizations can do to decrease the chances that these types of attacks might happen to them in the future. So this next slide um, will delve into just a few risk mitigation techniques that we see organizations can take um, to assist with the attack types we've been discussing today. The first is segmentation, 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 and I probably can't emphasize that enough. In every case where X-Force has observed Ryuk migrate over into ICS portions of a network, poor segmentation always played a role. And there's a lot of theories about how to most effectively segment ICS networks from their counterpart enterprise or IT networks. Um, one thing that X-Force recommends is creating an industrial demilitarized zone between the two of them to create a buffer. Um, also, if you use domain controllers in your ICS network, be sure to disable any kind of internet access to them, since of course we have seen domain controllers as that critical access point. And ideally, it should be possible to unplug the ICS network from the IT network and so that the enterprise IT um, network or the ICS network can maintain full operations without one another and that there aren't those dependencies. Second, when it comes to preventing ransomware attacks, X-Force has been 
working with our clients to really focus on guarding domain controllers and domain administrator accounts. In almost every ransomware attack we see today, ransomware attackers are going after domain controllers and domain administrator accounts. So reducing the number of these accounts in a network to the absolute minimum and locking domain administrator accounts to domain controllers and so that they can't be accessed in any other way, and disabling um, local administrator rights for all accounts, and then closely monitoring and auditing any domain administrator accounts that you do have um, can help assist in uh, making it more difficult for ransomware attackers to gain access to those networks. And third, we recommend working ICS networks into your incident response plan for ransomware. So having and drilling a response plan for ransomware is imperative because especially these days it's often not a question of if, but when. Um, and, and sometimes organizations, even if they have ICS networks, are not considering the ICS ramifications. So if ransomware did get onto an ICS network, or even if it didn't, you know, what would be the proper procedures to respond? When would an ICS network have to be shut down? And should it be shut down even if there's not ransomware on that network? Um, so these are worth thinking through. And CISLA has provided guidance that can be helpful in establishing an ICS relevant ransomware plan uh, and also recommends considering the full range of impacts to ICS environments that a cyber attack might have. So from there, I don't know if we have any time left for questions. Um, I'd be happy to take questions or you are welcome to come up to me afterwards or contact me afterwards and I would be happy to continue the discussion from there. Are we doing on time? Four minutes. Four minutes, okay. Do we have a microphone for questions or no? Uh, you can, really yes, just be uh, really loud. <laughs> Can use the mic or the recording won't have it. Yeah. We can so, lower it down. Okay. Yeah. So the question was just about the phishing email to the PowerShell loader. Were there any additional steps in there? Um, and I was just saying that, uh, yes, there, there were a couple more steps that did take place in there. And specifically, it was a Microsoft Office document um, that it appears dropped that particular um, PowerShell loader. So, and I should specify there is, even before the PowerShell loader, the, it dropped TrickBot. So it would be a TrickBot and sometimes Emotet and then a PowerShell loader. So, but they're, they're using a lot of different tools, especially in that um, stage where they're gaining uh, persistence on the network. Thank you. Uh, so I was just curious why your slides were labeled TLP Amber, just out of curiosity. Yeah. So, and that's just because um, there is information in here that comes from X-Force incident response from work with our clients. Um, and so I would just ask that you, you know, uh, you keep this information here. I'm, I'm happy to, to share it, but, um, but we do want to be careful about how we're sharing information about our clients. Is Ryuk one of those ransomwares where you can actually get your files back if you pay them the money, or do they not implement the decryption part of the ransomware? So you're asking, do Ryuk decryptors work? Yes. Yes. So we have seen the decryptor work. So we have seen people pay the ransom, and then they do actually get their files back. Um, there's a lot of you know ins and outs on how that happens. Um, some organizations 
have trouble using the decryptor even if they pay for it and get it. And even if it does technically work, some, you know, sometimes it can take a couple tries to figure out exactly how to make it work correctly. Um, and some ransomware groups provide services to assist organizations through that process. We have seen instances where people buy the decryptor and then the ransomware group disappears and they can't get the decryptor to work. So they've paid the ransom, they have the decryptor, but they're not able to get it to work. So, um, so there's a lot of caveats there, but bottom line, yes, we have seen Ryuk's decryptor work. Uh, I will say we have seen other ransomware groups, these are usually smaller, less sophisticated groups where the decryptor does not work and it's, it's broken and there are some um, mistakes that the malware developers created and so even if you use the decryptor it wouldn't be able to work but as our malware reverse engineers have picked apart the ransomware and have um, tried to figure out how the decryption mechanism works, we've actually been able to build a decryptor ourselves to decrypt the ransomware. That's happened twice now. Um, so you can go read about those two instances on our blog. One is Thanos ransomware, and so the other was Jest ransomware. So, um, so sometimes that happens, but the larger groups like Ryuk, their decryptors do tend to work, and their encryption, encryption mechanisms do tend to be uh, very sophisticated. So, all right, I think that's all the questions we have time for, but thank you very much for your attention.